Welcome back to Paper Things. Today we'll be reading chapters 20 through 23. Chapter 20, Vouchers. It's weird how something from when you were little will pop back up again later in life. I remember being in the car. It must have been with Jana since Mama didn't drive. Stopped at a light and looking out the window at a row of houses all connected. Each house had its own tiny fenced-in backyard. There wasn't much grass in each yard. It was mostly dirt that had been dug up by plastic shovels, bent spoons, or paws. Some of the yards had little hibachi grills, and most were scattered with plastic toys, toppled big wheels and baby dolls laying face down in the dirt. I'd like to live there, I'd said. In public housing? Gage had asked. It looks like fun, I'd said. Everyone's together. It's those very same houses that we're coming up to now. The houses aren't in the part of the East End where Jana lives, outside loop with views of the harbor, or where Sasha lives, tiny inside streets near the shops. Instead, they're down near the warehouses, warehouses that used to be factories according to Gage, but now just store stuff. Remember when I used to want to live here? I asked my brother, now that I've caught up. He's looking at a slip of paper. We're not in these units, he says. We're across the street. I look up at a gray building that looks less like apartments and more like offices for the warehouses. It has a flat roof and rectangular windows. Gage and I have just gone in through the glass front door and are trying to make sense of the numbers on the mailboxes when an older gentleman comes up the steps behind us. Gage, he says. It's the landlord. Gage shakes his hand, introduces me, and apologizes for being late. Not to worry, the man says. These things happen. He leads us back outside and around the corner of the building. The apartment has its own entrance, he says as we follow him down a stairway. Our apartment is in the basement. The landlord opens the door, and after my eyes adjust to the dimness, I can see that this is the apartment in the pictures. Only it looks smaller, more cellar-ish in person. I expected the apartment to be empty, waiting for us to move in, but it looks like someone still lives there. As Gage and the man walk around talking about the price of the heat and electricity, I try to picture the two of us all moved in. On the orange counter is an old toaster oven and a monkey cookie jar. I wonder if the people who live here bought the cookie jar at the one-stop party shop. If so, maybe Briggs can get me one just like it. I'll fill it with peanut butter cookies like the ones that Jana and I used to make. It was always my job to make crisscrosses across the top of the cookies with a fork. Only two crisscrosses, Jana would say. When I'd ask why, she'd say, just because. Instead of there being a cabinet below the sink, a brightly colored cloth hangs down to hide the stuff that's under there. I want to peek, but I don't want to be nosy. Instead, I go look at the two bedrooms, trying to guess which one will be mine. I can tell from the furniture and decorations that an adult sleeps in one of the rooms and a boy and his baby sister in the other. The rooms look to be about the same size, but for whatever reason, I picture myself in the kids' bedroom. I imagine my bed pressed against one wall, which would leave room for a desk along the wall by the door. Maybe we could find a cheap desk on Craigslist or somewhere. It doesn't have to be fancy, just someplace quiet for me to do homework. Now I can't help myself. I decide to be nosy after all and look inside the closet. There isn't a bar inside the small closet for hanging clothes, just hooks against the back and the sides. But there is a bookshelf in the closet where clothes have been folded and stuffed in. I bet Gage could put up a bar, though, if I asked him. Jana would want me to hang my uniform on actual hangers, not on hooks. Besides, if I can hang up some of my clothes on a bar, then I can use the bookshelf to set up my paper things. I'll have a room for all three stories and the top could be a rooftop terrace instead of a backyard. 
I'll be able to play paper things anytime I want, and no one will have to step around them. If I have Sasha over and don't want her to see them, I can just shut my closet door. Yeah, I think this will work, I hear Gage say, and I bounce up and down in my new room. I can't believe that we will have a place, our very own place, to come home to every night. Do you have the voucher? The landlord asks. I stand next to Gage so I can hear all the details. Voucher? From the housing authority. I can tell that my brother is confused. He's pausing so the man will say more and he won't look ignorant. The rent on this apartment is subsidi subsidized. In order to live here, you have to have proof from the housing authority that your income falls below a certain level. Can't I just tell you what I make, says Gage, or get my boss to write something? Trust me, it's low, really low. He laughs, and so does the man. Yeah, I get you, says the landlord, but the city has to make sure. I can't just rent this one out from under the people who have completed the paperwork and who are still waiting for housing. Gage's face shudders, like it used to when Janice started in on him about something or other. I can tell that he's done listening, that he's given up hope. Where do we go to get the voucher, I ask. The housing authority, but don't get your hopes up, he says, says to me. It will take days, maybe even weeks for you to qualify. Folks have been looking at this apartment since seven this morning. It'll be gone by tomorrow. So now we're back on the streets and once again I'm running in my flapping shoe, trying to keep up with my brother. Let's go to the housing authority right now, I shout. It's closed, Airy, he yells back to me like I don't know anything. It's closed, and even if it were open, I don't know what I have to take there to prove that I make little. Can't you just give them your boss's phone number? He'll tell them what you make. I just got the job. It's probably not even considered steady work yet. And what will I write down when they ask for our current address? My mind starts working on possible answers. Jana's address or maybe Chloe's or Briggs's? Surely the housing authority people wouldn't follow up to verify that we lived there, right? But I don't make any suggestions. No idea will be the right one. No words will make Gage feel better. Not right now. Eventually, Gage's pace slows, and I catch up and walk by his side. I can tell that he's thinking. I want him to think out loud, but that isn't his style. Finally, he turns to me and says in a voice much kinder than the one he's been using since we left the apartment, You must have been scared when I didn't pick you up at Head Start. I shrug like it was no big deal, but tears sting my eyes. Now I'm the tired one. Tired of uncertainty, tired of the unfamiliar, tired of try trying to figure things out. For a few moments, I want to be five years old again. I want someone to plunk me in front of a Disney movie and ask, would you like apple juice or grape? I'm so sorry, Airy, he says and puts his arm around me. So sorry. What if you hadn't found me? I messed up big time. He stops and turns me toward him. Forgive me? Maybe, I say, and he squeezes me against his side. I need to call Carol, I add. I've been going back and forth in my head all day, but now I'm sure of it. We have to get a phone, he says. What I want to say is, talk to Jana. Tell her that we don't really have an apartment. Maybe she'll reactivate your phone. But I don't. Instead, I say, phones are tray expensive. Not all of them, says Gage. There are pay-as-you-go phones. Besides, a phone is not a luxury. It's a necessity. You need to be able to reach me. My boss needs to be able to reach me. And Chloe, I think, but I don't say it out loud. 
Something tells me Chloe's patience would run out altogether if she couldn't reach Gage when she wanted to. I start to ask Gage where he'll get the money, but I already know. The money will have to come from the first and last month's rent savings. Just an hour ago, it felt like we were so close to getting an apartment. Now it feels like a lifetime away. We ride the bus all the way out to Walmart, where it takes Gage forever to choose a phone. The pretty sales clerk tries to sell him a more expensive model, a phone with a data plan or a phone with flashy features. Gage keeps repeating the same thing. I want the cheapest phone you have, and I want to keep my old number. The sales clerk doesn't think that keeping his number will be possible, but it's obvious that, that she likes Gage, and in the end, after a ridiculously long call to our new telephone company, she finds a way. Still, I can tell when we go to check out and Gage pulls $50 from his wallet that he feels anything but glad. I've often heard the expression, two steps forward, one step back. Now I know what it means. That's what it's like trying to live on our own. Or maybe two steps forward and ten steps back. I don't ask where we're sleeping tonight. I don't have to. When Gage is feeling beaten down, we stay away from friends. Being with friends who have jobs and apartments, he says, makes him feel like a loser. The streets are getting darker. Headlights glare into my eyes. Tonight, we're headed for the shelter. Chapter 21, checks. Technically, we're not allowed to stay at Lighthouse. First of all, first of all you're supposed to be between 12 and 20 years old, so I don't qualify. Second of all, you're supposed to fill out paperwork when you check in, just like at the family shelter, but West doesn't make us register. He sneaks us into Lighthouse, which is not a lighthouse at all, but an old-looking three-story white and brown apartment house. The offices and kitchen are on the first floor. The second floor is the boys' floor, and the third floor is the girls'. Each floor holds up to eight kids for a total of 16 people per night. But West usually slips us into a little first floor storage room where we sleep on mats on the floor. You would think that staying hidden downstairs would keep our stuff safer, but you'd be wrong. Kids are always raiding the downstairs rooms, looking for anything to take with them. So the first time when Gage and I left to use the bathrooms, stuff was taken. Now we know to leave the storage room one at a time. Fortunately, I can lock the door from inside when Gage is gone. We haven't had dinner, but we are on our way to Lighthouse anyway. West only works until 8, and it must be getting close to that now. About half a block away from Lighthouse, we stop in front of a parking garage so that Gage can call West. Only, for whatever reason, West doesn't answer. Gage tries again, but nothing. What's tonight? he asks but he doesn't wait for an answer. West should be working. Sleet starts to fall. I pull up my hood. My toes, especially the ones in the flappy shoe, are numb. I jump up and down to wake them back up. I'm hungry, but I don't say so. I wonder what the snack will be at Lighthouse tonight. I might ask West if he can grab me two shares before he leaves. That will make Gage mad, but I don't care. I was so busy making snowflakes that I hardly ate anything at Head Start. Ariana, a man's voice calls from across the street. I look around to see who might be calling me. For a moment, I'm convinced that this has something to do with West, that we're in trouble for trying to sneak into Lighthouse, though I know that's crazy. And then I see who it is. Reggie, the airplane man. He waves to me from across the street. Amelia is with him and she wags her tail when he, she sees me. How lucky is this? Hey, Reggie, I call. I was hoping to see you. I have something for you. Reggie crosses the street and I try to introduce him to Gage, but Gage is concentrating on his frantic texting. In a confetti toss of words, I tell Reggie about his plane, the cupola, 
Gage's new job and Fran's bike plane, but he notices my teeth are chattering and interrupts me to ask where we're headed. I could walk with you while you tell me the whole story, he says. We're kind of hoping to stay there, I say, pointing to the shelter, but I can tell from Gage's eyes that he heard me and he wants me to shut up. Shelter full? Reggie asks when Gage finally looks up from his phone. Gage nods. I wonder what the real story is. Look, says Reggie, I don't mean to be presumptuous, but I've got a place you can stay tonight. It's not the Taj Mahal. It's not even Motel 6, but it's warm. We appreciate the offer, sir, Gage starts to say, pulling his wool cap down lower, but Reggie interrupts him. You'd actually be doing me a favor. I'm hoping to stay at the men's shelter tonight, have a shower, maybe watch a little TV, but they don't allow dogs. If you could stay at my place and watch Amelia for me, I'd be grateful. I look at Gage with pleading eyes, but he hesitates. It's pretty modest, Reggie says apologetically. There isn't even a proper bathroom, though I make do with a camping toilet. But it's dry and warm and no one will bother you. He goes on to explain that the place he rents is a heated storage unit down on Marginal Way. I moved all my stuff in when I lost the house, he says. It's a little crowded, but I've managed to set it up almost like an apartment. And you're not planning to stay there tonight? Gage asks, sounding almost suspicious. I want to scold him for being so rude, but I remind myself that he doesn't know Reggie and Amelia like I do. Besides, Gage has never been one for trusting new people. I will if I have to, Reggie says. I can't very well abandon this old girl, he says, reaching down to scratch Amelia behind the ears. But I have been looking forward to that shower and to seeing some of my buddies at the shelter. The wind picks up speed and the sleet hits my face like a million tiny pinpricks. Finally, I can't take it any longer. Please say yes, I shout, tugging on Gage's arm. Please. Gage looks down at me, shrugs, and mutters. Okay, then. Thanks. We follow Reggie across town to the storage units. First, Reggie has to tap a code on a keypad clipped to a tall metal fence. After we go through the gate in the fence, he has to type the code into a box outside the door of a tray big brick building, which looks kind of like a garage. Once we're inside, he leads us down a brightly lit hall of shed doors until we arrive at number 26. Then he taps in another code and the door opens to reveal boxes. All I can see is a wall of boxes boxes that seem to go all the way up to the tall ceiling. I try to hide my disappointment because I don't want to seem ungrateful, but I think Reggie was stretching the truth quite a bit to describe this place as apartment-like. To me, it just looks like storage, a very crowded storage shed. But then Amelia leads us on a small path through the boxes, a path I hadn't even seen. Reggie motions for us to follow her, and so we do, and lo and behold, we come out into a long, skinny room set up just like an apartment. Along the wall to the left is a camp cot. Next to the cot is a nightstand with a big flashlight on it, and beside that, a camouflage print dog bed. Along the wall to the right is a long, narrow table. On the table is a plastic jug of water, a small coffee maker, a cooking burner, and a toaster oven. Next to the table is a little refrigerator, the kind you see in back-to-school flyers advertising stuff for dorm rooms. On top of the refrigerator is a cooking pot, a cup and a plate, and a pitcher full of cooking utensils. In the middle of the room sits a handsome coffee table. Right now there's a model airplane being built on the coffee table. A plastic one, not a paper one. Reggie sure has a thing for planes. A camping porta potty sits in the corner at the foot of the bed. Like I said, it's pretty modest. Reggie sounds almost embarrassed. It's wonderful, I say. Amelia wags her tail in agreement. Reggie blushes and takes a mattress pad from a box and places it on the floor. 
He also retrieves a rolled up sleeping bag and a few quilts, which he tosses onto the cot. You guys hungry? I've got corned beef hash or tuna noodles. I nod, eager to see Reggie prepare a meal in this secret house, but Gage bristles. Hey man, Gage says, you don't have to feed us too. It's my pleasure, says Reggie. I'd rather eat with the two of you than some of the slobs at the shelter. He winks at me and I smile in return. While Reggie mixes up the tuna helper, he tells me where to dig for more cups and dishes. Mixed in among the boxes are a bicycle tire and pump, a pair of ski boots, and a plastic sled. The boxes themselves are filled with tools, pictures in frames, and candles. The candles make me think of electricity, and when I ask about it, Gage points out the outlet on the overhead light that powers this room. This place is great, I say. How much does it cost a month? Airy, Gage snaps. But Reggie doesn't seem to mind the question. It's cheaper than renting an apartment, he says, even Section 8. But I don't recommend living in a, store at un in a storage unit if you can help it. It's hard to live without plumbing. Besides, it's technically against the law for me to sleep here. But it's against the law for me to sleep in the park or at the bus station, too. So what are you going to do when the shelters are full? He asks with a shrug. What's Section 8? I ask. Gage speaks up. It's like that apartment we saw tonight. Units that are set aside for people who income qualify. I want to ask Reggie why he isn't living in the house where all this furniture came from, but I'm worried the question is too rude, and I don't want him to change his mind about letting us stay here. Instead, I polish off my tuna helper and pull Fran's bicycle ad out of my backpack, along with her three dollars, and ask Reggie if he would make her an airplane too. I tell him again about the wish I made on my plane and how it came true. She's paying me to make her a paper airplane? Yep, I said, but if you don't want to, oh, I don't mind doing it and the money will come in handy for dog food. He hands me back a dollar. This one's for you though, he says, for being my business partner. I shake my head, oh no, she wanted you to have it. But I wouldn't have this job if not for you. You were the one who told your friend about the plane I gave you, and you were the one who came up with the idea of making a wishing plane. I look at Gage, who nods that it's okay. Thanks, I say, reluctantly taking the dollar. I can't help remembering that Reggie needed money for Amelia and wonder how he bought the tuna and how he pays the rent for his storage unit. Disability check, says Reggie, as if he's reading my mind. He begins to fold Fran's plane. I get a check each month, but it's not enough to make it through 30 days. Were you in the service? Gage asks. Reggie nods. Air Force. A pilot. Our dad was in the army, Gage says. He was killed in Afghanistan, I say. Reggie nods. I'm sorry to hear that. Did you lose your house because of your disability? Gage asks. Now it's my turn to shoot him a look for being too nosy. But again, Reggie doesn't seem to mind the question. He hands me Fran's plane and says, yeah, you might say my disability led to the loss of a lot of things. Reggie's quiet, but then he looks up and smiles. But I'm luckier than a lot of folks, and you can be sure I'm grateful for all that I've got like new friends. He raises his cup of water to us. To new friends, Gage and I say together. Chapter 22, Snowflakes. After dinner, Reggie takes Amelia for a short walk and then says he'll be leaving for the shelter now, but that he'll be back in the morning to pick up his girl. He shows us how to keep the door locked from the inside and then gives Gage the security codes to put in his phone, cautioning, cautioning us not to leave without them. After Reggie leaves, I call dibs on the mattress pad so I can cuddle with Amelia all night. There's no better feeling than looking into a dog's eyes. It's like they fetch all the love you can possibly throw out, and then they give it back to you. That, and they seem to know all your secrets. 
can we get a dog, I ask, when we get an apartment? It doesn't have to be a big dog like Amelia. It can be small like Leroy. No way, says Gage. You heard, Reggie. Dog food's expensive, and dogs need licenses and shots and a bunch of other stuff, too. But I'm collecting change. Do you have homework tonight? Gage interrupts. I can tell that he's tired and not in any mood to argue. I do, but I lie. I'm tired, too. Too tired to work on my report, too tired to do my math, too tired even to play paper things. Besides, I've started rubbing Amelia's belly and now she won't let me stop. Gage turns out the light and as I lie back on the mattress pad, I remember that I don't have a clean shirt in my backpack. My already dirty shirt probably smells even worse after all the running around we did today. I guess that's another downsize of living in a storage unit. No washing machine. No clean shirt tomorrow, I whisper to Amelia in the dark. It's just one more secret to her. You can wear the white one Briggs loaned me, Gage says, apparently still awake. The one I wore to my interview. It'll be huge, I say. It won't be that big. Wear it under your tiger's vest. It'll look cute, he says, I promise. What choice do I really have? I can't very well... Uh, wear a smelly shirt to school again, not after all the nasty comments Sasha and Linny made last time, though I'm sure I'll get an earful about how silly I look wearing a man's shirt. Sometimes there's just no winning, I think. I rub Amelia's belly till my eyes drift shut. Gage's new phone rings at some ridiculously early hour, or at least I think it's a ridiculously early hour. Who can tell when you're sleeping in a box without windows? Who? Growls Gage into the phone. I think it's a wrong number, but then he hands the phone to me. Hello? It's Daniel. Have you looked outside? No, I... It's snowing! In Maine, snow in April, especially at the beginning of the month, is no big deal. I remember one time we got snow in June, so it takes me a moment or two to realize what he's suggesting. Will we be ready? I ask. I made some snowflakes yesterday at Head Start, but probably only 50 or so. That's perfect. I made a bunch last night, too. I think we must have known snow was coming. Yeah, I guess so, I say, though really, I was just happy to have a new activity to share with the starters. Can you meet me at the school in half an hour? Daniel says. That should give us plenty of time to set things up. What time is it anyway? I ask, glancing at Gage, who is moaning under his pillow. Six. Let's hope the building opens this early or we're sunk. Gage isn't too keen on letting me leave the warehouse without him, though it's far too early for him to show up at work. He offers to walk me to the bus stop, but I remind him that we can't leave Amelia alone in the storage unit. If she barked or howled, she'd be discovered and taken away from Reggie, and he'd probably lose the storage unit too. And Reggie might be really upset if we got back and not only were we gone, but so was his dog. Besides, I add, I'm 11. That's old enough to walk to the bus stop by myself. I can tell that Gage wants to argue some more, but eventually he gives me Briggs's big white shirt to wear and lets me go. Daniel is standing outside Eastland when I arrive. My feet are soaked, but I'm too nervous to mind. Did you bring tape? I ask him. Of course, he says. Thankfully, he doesn't ask me why I didn't bring any. Daniel strides up to the front door and gives it a confident tug, but nothing happens. He frowns and tries again. Locked, he says, like he can't believe the door wouldn't be open at 6.30 in the morning. What now, I ask, stamping my feet to try to warm them. Daniel looks around and then smiles. Tracks, he says, pointing to large footprints in the snow, footprints that definitely don't belong to either of us. We follow them with our eyes from the front door back up the walkway and to the parking lot where the janitor's car is parked. A thin layer of snow dusts the windshield, though the hood is clear, 
probably because it's still warm. Come on, Daniel says, walking around the building. She's got to be in here somewhere. Sure enough, we see someone vacuuming in one of the third grade rooms. We rap on the window and the vacuuming stops. As the figure approaches, I see that it's not Mrs. Hurley, the janitor, but Yan, her helper. I wonder if he walked to the school or if he and Mrs. Hurley carpooled. Anyway, he frowns when he sees us and motions for us to go back around the corner to the nearest door. He opens the door just a crack, his frown deepening. It's clear that he doesn't really want to let us in. My stomach ties a knot or two. Eastland tradition, says Daniel, as if he's 20 and not 11. We've got to hang up snowflakes today. Yan has only worked for Mrs. Hurley for a few months, so I'm not sure what he makes of this talk of tradition and snowflakes, but he slowly steps aside to let us pass. Be good, he calls as we tear down the hall toward the front office. Being in the school when no one else is here is both really cool and very eerie. Now more than ever, I feel like a ghost, though a ghost with a friend this time. I think of things we could get away with right now, sneaking into the teacher's lounge, rearranging desks in classrooms, hanging safety posters upside down. If I wasn't trying so hard to get into Carter, I might suggest some of these things to Daniel. I wonder if this is what it look it's like for kids like Linny, who don't have to worry about being good all the time because they don't care about getting into Carter. Is life a lot more relaxing and fun when you don't have to try so hard? Daniel quickly surveys the window outside the front office. Help me pull this bench over and we can begin up high. Before we know it, the front hall of our school has been blitzed with snowflakes. Just like old times, snowflakes appear to float from the ceiling to the floor in the main hall. It looks amazing and I can't wait for everyone to see it, especially Sasha. We've still got an hour before school starts, Daniel says. Want to make more? Snowflakes? I ask stupidly. Where would we put them? The walls and windows of the main hall are practically filled with, with flakes already. Anywhere, Daniel says. His enthusiasm is catching. We could put some in Mrs. Mr. O's room, I suggest. He always liked the snowflake tradition. And maybe in the cafeteria, too. We head down to the art room for scissors and raid the recycling bin for paper. Don't be too particular about these, Daniel says as we start folding and cutting at the large art room table. It's the overall effect we want. So we mass produce the easiest snowflakes we can. They're not very fancy, but we've learned to cut more than one at a time and soon they're piling up. We finish decorating Mr. O's room in record time and move on to the cafeteria. We can hear movement now in the hallways, teachers and students arriving and we start taping even faster than before. At one point, we're almost caught when Ms. Finch walks by the doors, but we duck behind the tables and she doesn't see us. 10 minutes before the bell is supposed to ring, we head to the hall where our lockers are located, acting like we just arrived, but my stomach is jumping like it's Christmas morning. The school looks amazing. I can't believe that we were able to hang so many dazzling snowflakes that in less than two hours, we created this wintry magic. Sasha approaches me with Keisha at her side. I wonder where Lenny is. Has Sasha ditched her too and moved on to Keisha? I hold my breath, waiting to hear what Sasha has to say. Will she know that the snowflakes were my doing? It's weird to keep such a big secret from my best friend, or maybe my former best friend, to my surprise, Keisha grabs my arm. Hey, Ari, she says, that shirt looks really cool. Doesn't it, Sasha? Where'd you get it? At first, I worry that she's making fun of me. Briggs's shirt was just as big as I'd feared it would be, though I'd worn it under my vest, as Gage has, had suggested, and I rolled up the sleeves. Maybe the look was pretty cool. I borrowed it from a friend, I say mysteriously. Cool, Keisha says again. Sasha just gives me a wide-eyed look. I smile and turn to head into math. 
I decide to keep my secrets just a little bit longer. Chapter 23, Towels. I'm in my seat trying madly to complete last night's math homework before the bell rings while still listening to the reactions to the snowflakes. I can't help it. Most of the kids are guessing that adults did it, either the PTO or the basketball boosters or something. Some kids are a little grouchy about it. It was fun when we got to do the snowflakes, they complain. Their reactions make me realize that we probably should have involved more kids from the beginning. Class is just about to begin when Mr. Chandler's voice comes over the loudspeaker. Would the young man and the young lady who decided to enter the school unlawfully this morning and further deface school property come to the office immediately? Unlawfully? Deface? I glance at Daniel. Neither of us moves. A few minutes later, Mr. Chandler's voice comes over the loudspeaker again. Would Daniel Huber and Ariana Hazard please come to the office? My wobbly knees are not to be trusted, but I stand up. Out of the corner of my eye, I see Daniel doing the same. The kids around us are shocked. Airy? I hear Sasha gasp, and I don't dare look at her. Daniel and I grab our backpacks and head for the door. How does he know it's us? I ask as soon as we're in the hall. I don't think Yan even knows who we are. There's probably a security camera, says Daniel. I can't believe I didn't think of that. What do you think's gonna happen? My stomach is back to doing flip-flops and that's when I remember that I didn't have any breakfast this morning. I didn't pack a lunch either. Not that I can imagine eating a thing. I don't know, says Daniel, but think about what you're going to say to Mr. Chandler. Why are Eastland traditions important? I try to think of this like an essay for Carter. If I had to explain why I wanted to reinstate the traditions at Eastland Elementary, what would I say? Maybe something about how traditions give us a sense of belonging, that doing the same activities each year, the very same activities that our older siblings or even our parents did, makes us feel like we're all one big family. And events like the fifth grade campout give us something to look forward to as we grow older. But rather than feeling prepared, I feel a little lightheaded. My stomach continues cramping. I don't know how I'm ever going to survive this meeting. Mr. Mr. Chandler stands at the end of the hall, watching us approach. He's wearing that look that parents and teachers have when they're disappointed in you. And I can't help feeling that it's directed more at me than at Daniel. While Daniel has visited the principal's office regularly since kindergarten, inclu including more than a few times this year with Mr. Chandler, as Mademoiselle likes to say, Daniel is always thinking outside the box. I've never actually been sent to the office. Up until now, I've been known to Mr. Chandler as Jana's girl. Jana is one of those people who always volunteers, mostly, I think, because she likes to be the boss. I wonder if Mr. Chandler has noticed that she's stopped volunteering lately. Does Jana know what you were up to this morning? He asks once we reach him. No, sir, I say, my voice quavering. How am I ever going to get through my speech? He takes a breath leans back on his heels and digs his hands deeper into his pockets. Do you two know the hours that Mrs. Hurley and Yan will need to spend to get glitter off these recently polished floors? At this, he lifts his shoe to reveal the glitter that has stuck to it. I shoot Daniel a guilty look. The only snowflakes with glitter had been mine. Mr. Chandler continues without waiting for an answer. It was one thing to enter the building before school started and to post paper and tape on the walls of school property, but to create hours and hours of extra work for two people who already work quite hard, well, that's truly unfair. Daniel screws his face up and I can't tell if he's thinking, a few sparkles never hurt anyone, or it was pretty stupid, Airy, to make snowflakes with glitter, 
or maybe he's thinking something else entirely. Follow me, says Mr. Chandler, as he leads us towards the custodian's closet. Speak up, Daniel whispers to me. I widen my eyes and I shrug my shoulders. What could I possibly say? Mr. Chandler is right about the glitter. It was inconsiderate. He unlocks the closet and turns to us. First, I want you to take the snowflakes down, and then I want you to use these mops to get the glitter off the floor. Say something, Airy, Daniel whispers when Mr. Chandler heads down the hall ahead of us. He's making an example of us. I can tell that Daniel's pretty bummed right now. My stomach lurches. Mr. Chandler, I say. It comes out as a squeak, so I try again. Mr. Chandler? He turns and looks at me. We didn't mean to cause extra work. The glitter is my fault. I didn't realize. I stop. My stomach is lurching. Before I even know what's happening, a huge wave of tuna noodle casserole rises from my belly, explodes past my tonsils, and sprays down the hall at a record distance. Oh, I crouch over, holding my stomach and crying, but not before I see the splat on Mr. Chandler's pant leg and the look of horror on his face. I know Daniel well enough to know that there's probably a look of sheer delight on his. I don't dare move, but I can hear Mr. Chandler directing his secretary to make three phone calls. One to Mrs. Hurley, one to the school nurse, and the other, before I can think of how to stop him, to Jana. That's all for this week with Paper Things. Come back next week and we'll read more chapters together.